Hello and welcome everyone to the Develop Terraform Modules and Create Infrastructure Quickly with the CloudBricks Framework webinar. My name is Tara Van Cleve and I'm a Marketing Event Manager for the Developer Initiative here at Oracle. Today we're excited to walk you through the CloudBricks Framework and show you how to develop a new Terraform module. We'll be recording today's session and you will receive a link shortly after the webinar concludes at the same email address you registered for today's event with. If you have any questions during the webinar, please ask them in the Slack channel and we'll answer them during the Q&A after the demo concludes. The link to join is bit.ly slash join underscore the underscore Slack. And once you're in, you'll land in the general channel. From there, you can search for webinar dash cloudbricks dash 0512 for the date to reach our dedicated space for Q&A today. Today's webinar will be presented by Denny Alquinta, Principal Cloud Architect. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Denny. So picture the following. Um, I need to assemble an environment that first takes care of all of the networking stuff, then allows me to have a place to deploy the things that I need, and then I can basically get rid of everything in a finger snap. That pretty much sounds pretty, pretty neat, right? But in reality, what happens is that most of these things, I would probably need to manage them manually. And then a massive amount of error prone tasks can kick in. Uh, if we put it in perspective, let's go into detail on this. So in order to have a functional network, uh, first, you need to come up with some sort of compartment system in OCI. Then uh, you need to configure the proper VCN and all of its pertaining uh, artifacts like subnets, uh, like all of the gateways that you can get out there, like uh, routing rules, et cetera. Then uh, you need to figure out, well, do I need any other copy of the system or maybe I need to provision some sort of lower environment? Uh, maybe I need a copy of that. Maybe I need a crush and burn thing, I don't know. Then I need to ask myself, am I going to work in an environment that is meant to persist in time? Like, let's say a single production development kind of thing, or maybe I will have some inner, um, some inner environments in the middle. Well, you never know, right? Once I have that figured out, then I need to provision my actual infrastructure. So maybe a set of computes, and maybe then I'll need to attach some sort of block storage to that um, compute. Or maybe I need to provision some sort of Kubernetes environment here because my entire application is composed by a monolith in combination with microservices. So options are infinite at this point. And basically each and every single thing that you introduce in this creation can create potential problems of configuration or some other issues that quite frankly, in the future, you're probably going to neglect scene. So when I have this thing in place, sometimes, and pretty much all of the time, the stats are inevitably going to lead you to something that's called jack shaving. Uh, probably you have heard of this. Uh, this comes from a very old show that is called Ren and Stimpy. You can research on that. It's pretty funny. It's kind of similar to what the Kubernetes name came from. Um, according to Wiktionary, uh, there are a couple of definitions for jack shaving. I like them both. So I'm going to share those with you. Jack shaving defines itself as any apparently useless activity, which by allowing you to overcome intermediate difficulties, allows you to solve a larger problem. Another fun definition of this is the less useful activity done consciously or subconsciously to procrastinate about a larger but more useful task. So when I go through this, I say, well, I need to go through a whole bunch of massive things to in the end have a functional set of artifacts. Let's say, for example, I can deal with a couple of disks so I can start working in what I needed to do. So whenever uh, you wanna do this, uh, probably you wanna do this quick. And this is the feedback that I get from my customers in the end. I want to have something ready to go to start working in the things that I need for the business or for whatever I have planned in mind. But the problem is that many times you don't even know where to start, right? And these are bad places to be because either you will want to do this fast 
but you don't have enough time to understand a new code methodology, or maybe you just want to focus on the business that you're trying to achieve. So at this point, the million dollar question that comes up is, what can I do to tackle this down? So all the things I talked to you about some slides ago can reflect back to the following. Enter the system. Probably you know what a system is, but the by the book definition of a system is a set of things working together as part of a mechanism or an interconnecting network that performs something bigger, right? So if you put it like that, and then a system is a composite of modules, right? That do something secluded and unique, but with some sort of orchestration, they're able to achieve a larger objective. <clears throat> so if I get back to my initial premise then, a system can be, for example, my network or maybe my compartment system, or maybe a combination of all of those things, which in simple terms, some people call a landing zone. Maybe uh, there is another system that can be my compute with a couple of block storage attached to it. And maybe another system can be a compute with file storage service, like an NFS thing, right? Or maybe I can just have a Kubernetes cluster with the implementation of the cluster and several node pools attached to it, right? So what is CloudBricks? CloudBricks is a framework that uses the system abstraction and allows you to orchestrate and encapsulate a particular functionality in what we call the front end. This can be abstracted to a solution so say, for example, you have a whole bunch of components that needs to do something. And this systems use something that we call a cloud brick, which is a set of decoupled version and secluded functional pieces of code that are grouped in something that we call the backend. So with this definition, it makes it a little more digestible in the app, right? The backend cloud brick uses the tag and release feature, which is very popular in software, of course, <clears throat> that allows you to, but um, in the end, allows you to have this orchestrated backend that won't suffer uh, when you introduce any kind of enhancement or bug fixing in your code. So it basically allows to deprecate functionality, allows you to advance and progress in time and doesn't really let you anything break whenever you are already using a specific tag version. So Cloudbrix follows the Sember uh, standards like uh, major, minor, and patching versions on its construct. So I will go into details on how this is done on the demo. So consider this example. This is a technology uh, mapping in a 2B scenario for a specific architecture where for some reason, uh, the requirement is to have a couple of Bastion servers for staking purposes, for example. And then I need to have a Kubernetes cluster with a set of node pools and a database cloud service um, deployed there as the database backend, okay? Also, you need to have all of the network stuff. So you have a couple of subnets, some sort of the raw tables, raw security lists, your VCN and your compartment system. So in that way, I can tell my system is composed in the front end by the following components. So I have a network system, right, to host all of my network stuff. I have a compartment system that it's going to generate the logical distribution of stuff that I will lay it on provision in here. I have an application system that probably will encapsulate both Kubernetes and the database. And I also have a bastion service, uh, bastion system, I'm sorry, that uh, it's going to encapsulate those two components. So. If I put it in perspective, then the things that I will need to make it work in the backend are this set of clockers. I will need the network artifacts for the network, the compartment system for the compartment, for the application, I will need a combination or orchestration of cloud bricks, which are the cluster, the node pools, and the database. And for the bastion system, I will just need a compute. So at this point, probably you can ask yourself, well, what if, for example, um, I need to decouple the database from the application because I don't know, 
maybe I need that database to linger in time um, and I don't want to destroy it when I run a Terraform and destroy it there, there, uh, on that system. Well, you basically can do that and you can have unitary systems for each component of a cloud break. That means that if I want to decouple, for example, the Bastion service, uh, the, the Bastion service here, I can have a whole bunch of different systems, each one including a single compute, or I can group them, or I can decouple them. In the end, the message here is that I can do anything as flexible as possible so that anyone can make use of this any way they like. So one of the good things about using modules whenever you work with Terraform is the fact that you can make it modular. You can apply something that is called the do not repeat yourself pattern. In that way, you will have less repeated code. You will have a minor blast radius whenever you develop code. And essentially you will just have to maintain a single module instead of a whole bunch of spread things out there. So where is cloud is located? you will probably uh, be asking to. So all CloudBricks uh, project, it's currently open source and it's hosted in the world GitHub repository under the following link. So if you go here and let me quickly show you that. Everything is currently hosted in here. So if you go to repositories and here you looking for CloudBricks, you will see all the currently available CloudBricks out there we continuously start adding more and more modules. Um, and kind of the idea of this is that each one of these components, it's completely decoupled from each other. So I don't know, I'm gonna show you, for example, uh, an autonomous database module. And the expectations here is that you will see inside that there is a reference architecture where you will have single network and compartments. And it pretty much shows you how to use the module. We will go into detail in how to use this in the demo. We also have a set of examples. So uh, you can go to this by going into here. And if you go inside the same repository and look for examples, um, you will get to this repository. Let me show you. There's this one that says OCI CloudBricks examples. And inside of it, there's a CLI directory that contains a lot of examples of the orchestration that I'm gonna talk to you about. So basically this is the front end thing on the framework. So there are examples for APEX, for databases, for Django deployments, I don't know, for LAMP stacks, computes with disks and combinations in between, Windows, Ubuntu, Linux, Oracle Linux stuff, and so on. We continuously are adding more and more examples there. So stay on the look for that. So as any other thing, uh, the framework has some caveats and I'm gonna go quickly through them. As you may be aware of, Terraform uh, heavily relies on something that it's called a TF state file. This file is the one that takes care of keeping the status of your infrastructure up to date. The Terraform is a declarative uh, language, essentially needs to have something to reflect on what the current status of the infrastructure is. And this specific file is paramount to your infrastructure because it contains that status. One of the mandatory things for this to happen is that this file needs to be unique. It needs to guarantee unicity and it needs to guarantee concurrent support. So the way that we do that is essentially by using the S3 compatibility API inside the framework. So I'm not gonna go into much detail in how we do this here because I'm gonna show you in the demo, but just bear in mind that in order to do this, you have to go to your user, you have to create a customer secret key you can name that any way you like, and that will give you a hash uh, that will only be shown once. So you need to store this thing safely. And then you need to create a file under your home directory of your pivot server, which is another thing that I'm gonna explain how to create. And you need to create this file that is called credentials. So you will be prompt for two entries here, an access key ID and an access key. So what appears here is your access key. And the access key ID is what you get right after you generate this uh, customer secret key and you hit close. So you hover on top of the thing that you just created and you will get this number. So essentially, when you finish this configuration, you will have a file that looks similar to this. So you have 71 there and you have the key in here that you copy it. This is the way that this should look like. On the other hand, the second thing is that some modules 
in the framework make heavy use of SDKs. And this is a pretty cool thing because whenever the provider and everything else runs short, you can always code your own thing. So probably you know that Oracle offers a lot of SDKs to uh, do whatever you want. I'm specifically a fan of the Python SDK. So essentially some of the modules will use Python and the Python SDK to do stuff, right? In order to enable that, you need to have the CLI enabled and installed and configured in your Pivot server. Same thing, I'm not gonna go into much detail in here, but essentially you have to be aware of that this is also a prerequisite whenever you work with Terraform, you need to have um, an API created so then you can put it in your credentials, but essentially this is the way to do it. You go to your user, you go to a add API keys, and then you can also create that in here contextually, or you can create it using OpenSSL, for example, and that will generate two pen files that essentially then you have to paste the public key in the add API key here. Then you install your CLI. This is the too long didn't read instruction. Just go ahead and execute that. And then um, it will prompt you for a file like this one that um, essentially is gonna just leave this part uh, pending for you to complete with the private key. So then your configuration file should look like this. Now let's go through some design patterns. And this is what has worked uh, for us as a team in the way that when we decide to create a new cloud rig, how to create the decoupling and what is the way to go whenever you do that. So the first thing is that um, Terraform is declarative. And by its essence, you can put everything on the same Terraform file and that's fine. But the problem with that is that then when you have to maintain that code, it makes it a little hard to understand which part is what. So here you have a screenshot of a specific thing. This is intentionally showing some errors that I'm gonna walk you through. But essentially here, you see that you have a structure. So you have something that is the license, of course, the git ignore file. You have a readme file. You have a resource file, which in the end is what's going to um, contain the resource that you're coding. Then you have a data source file that is going to include the definition of the data source pattern and the local accessors to your resources. Then you have an output file that is going to contain everything that you will eventually require to do forward integration with, for example, a configuration management tool like Ansible. You have the provider, which for this framework in particular has been deprecated to use the provider in the back end. You need to do that on the front end. Right? And I will go through the details later on. And you have a variables, which it's gonna contain the variables that you use in your project. So this will be the general structure that a backend cloud rig will have. On the other hand, the front end, it's a combination of things. So in here, you see that there is a system directory. You can do this like this. You can spread systems in different GitHub, right, uh, in different Git repositories or you can put it all over the same thing, like having, this is gonna be development. And inside of that, you can put as many systems as you want. Now, the important part in here is that um, on the outside, you can push a file that is called a common TFR file, which in essence will be all of the common variables that do not need to repeat inside each system. And then you have some scripts that can help make your life easier in case that you hook up this with some CI CD uh, pipeline system, but nothing out of the ordinary. What is important here is what's inside the system. This is what makes uh, the difference. So the design pattern here, it's pretty simple. You have a backend uh, file, which is where you're going to configure the S3 compatibility API. You have a main.df, which is where the orchestration of these modules happen. And essentially this is the place where you will orchestrate all of the components there are in the Debra repository, and essentially you can make use of it. Just use it. And any other configuration that you may do, you do it here on the front end. Then you have an output.tf, which essentially it's gonna extract whatever comes from the modules and it's gonna expose it for later usage. You have the provider, which now needs to be in here. And this contains which specific providers you're using inside your code. So it can be for, of course, in this case, mandatory use the OCI provider because you're going to connect 
against um, OCI, but you can also define your own providers in case you code one. Um, you can make use of anything you need. Then you have the systems.tfbar, which is the actual definition of your variables. And then last but not least, you have the file that is called variables.tf that contains the definition or redefinition of the overloaded variables that come from the backend. In here, we use two concepts which are important for managing Terraform. The first one is the overloading of a module. That means that you can use the same module for creating different front-end infrastructures, but you're in the end using the same back-end module. And in order to enable that, you need to use a second concept, which is called variable overloading that I'm gonna go through in detail whenever I show you the code. There are some things that unfortunately Terraform does not support, and this is one of them. So there is little repetition of the code, but it's minimal. So in this case, you just have to worry about using the variables rather than just understanding how that backend code works. So that's the neat part of this framework. So in here, I'm gonna walk you through how I typically uh, handle um, a Terraform module creation. So when you deal with Terraform, you typically have two types of uh, things, right? You have a resource and you have a data source. The resource itself, it's a representation of your artifact inside OCI. And the data source is a way to obtain the data that already exists or it's part of your runtime environment whenever you're creating infrastructure. So the typical thing that I do whenever I um, create a new backend module is doing this. This is the flow, the, 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 the flow diagram that I have in my head. So in this case, I'm highlighting how to create, for example, a compute mode. So this is the documentation for the registry. And this is pretty much how you build any single code in Terraform. Whenever you develop the backend module, uh, you will have a whole bunch of documentation already available, which contains all of the stuff that you can do with a specific resource. So if you go to this link, for example, and let me open this quickly here, you will see that this is the OCI core instance. And here you have an example, which is a massive thing. You see that it contains a lot of uh, parameters that can or cannot be implemented in case you need it. So in the case of the workflow here, the first thing after selecting the resource, I review the resource documentation. So I come here and I start reading all of the stuff and what it does in each case. So you have some optional stuff, you have some require stuff, and I need to understand what is what, right? So this is the second part. Then I will ask myself, okay, is this attribute mandatory for my implementation or not? It's either A or B. It is or is not mandatory. In case that is not mandatory, I'll ask if this attribute is required for my feature. In case that is not, then I immediately drop its usage because essentially you can always add this new feature in a new release using the tagging release feature. If it is uh, mandatory, then uh, the second thing that I ask is if this attribute depends on an already existing resource in the tenancy. Maybe it's something that I pre-created or it's something that I created in a separate system. In the case that it is, then I use the data source pattern to obtain that data. And in the case that it's not, I used a dynamic initializer, which I'm going to explain later what it is. Then on the other side of the flow, if that attribute is required, then I do the same. I come here and I understand if that already exists or not. If for some reason I need to use a dynamic initializer, which is in the end a fancy word to say a dynamic default value in the variables or an initializer in case that that variable can be nullified or cannot even exist. I cannot have null values in Terraform. So I will show you some examples on how to do that with a local accessor. Then I fix this to a static variable and I end the flow. That's how I build a module. On the other hand, the data source pattern is slightly different because I will have something like this and I'm gonna show you how this looks like. This is the data source for the OCI core instance. So you see it's pretty small. So then you have the documentation here and you have all the specific instance references that can eventually be used as filters. So that's important whenever you work with this kind of thing. 
So when I'm doing a data source pattern, basically I will review its documentation and I will go into the cyclic loop. The first thing that I would do is, does this accessor regards for another already existing resource? The typical use case for this is a VCM. And when I want to get a subnet that is inside a VCM, whenever I do that filter, and I want to filter out a specific OSIT for a um, subnet, I will need the VCM that it pertains to. But in order to get the VCM, I will get the compartment. So you get the cycle that eventually terminates into a singular unitary variable that you can filter out. I will show you that as well on the demo. So whenever you finish the cycle, eventually you will see if this documentation, uh, if there is proper documentation for that filter. And in case that this accessor that you're gonna give in the code is feasible to be null or empty, you add this dynamic initializer that is null of empty control clause. And then you set the local accessor and end. So this is gonna be much clearer when I show you the demo. So now let's go into the demo. And hopefully this takes probably 20 minutes so we can take all of the questions that you may have. So what's the, um, what's the demo here? So a few weeks ago, I was uh, discussing with one of my customers, um, what's the best way of provisioning a compute with a file storage service, in this case, a share file system. And right after this was done, execute the bash script inside of it. So they were taking a slightly different approach using this uh, by a direct, uh, a direct Python implementation. But the problem is that there were some synchronization stuff in the middle that were not allowing us to trigger this in the proper way. So there are plenty of workarounds for this. And I always say there's never a single way of doing stuff. You can do it in many ways but it is important to choose the right tool for the right use case. Whenever you talk about infrastructure provisioning, the first thing that you have to think about is some sort of infrastructure as code tool and specifically infrastructure provisioning tool. Um, Terraform is very simple to learn. And one of the good things about Terraform is that once you learn it for OCI, you have knowledge and working knowledge of working with Terraform with any other cloud provider out there. The same thing happens backwards. If you learn to use Terraform in AWS, for example, then chances are that you already know how to use Terraform in OCI. The only thing that changes is the module implementation of the registry. So each provider has its own way of declaring its own resources and the way that you will push the variables out there. But in the end, the methodology and the way that Terraform works, it's exactly the same. It doesn't change. So once you get how to work in here, you can port this code to work in any other place. Of course, doing the changes and small tweaks of that implementation. So as you see here, uh, this demo, it's, um, it's simple and it's a composite status. It has a compartment, then this call we're gonna call uh, CloudBricks demo. Then it has a VCN, and then it has a public subnet, and then it has a compute with a file storage service, and then I will execute a bash script, and this is all mounted into a public subnet just for the ease of the demonstration. This can be in a private subnet, it can be a micro-segmented uh, subnet, it can be peered with another VCN, you can do whatever you want. Yeah. So let me show you the code first. So here's how it goes here. Um, the first thing that I recommend whenever um, I work with Terraform, and this is just me and my experience, you can take it as, as a valid resource, of course. I never work in my laptop. I always use a pivot server on the cloud. And the reason for that is because there are some specific use cases <coughs> wherever your code will need to connect to the machine that is provisioning. In this case, it's gonna be like that. Because right after you provision your machine and your provision, your file storage service, you need to connect into that machine. And after doing that, you need to do a whole bunch of processes in order to mount that disk. If you do it locally from your laptop, it's gonna be a slightly complicated because you will not get access to the network, especially when you work with private subnets that are not routable from the internet. So, if you go to my tenancy, and I'm gonna show you that in here, and probably I can do this, that's better. So 
you see that here I have a compartment that is called CloudBricks, and it's in a specific place, right? Then the thing that I did was creating a machine here. So it's just about creating an instance and go through the details here, push your SSH key, and that's pretty much it. This has a public IP in here, and if, of course it has a private IP. I will use this one to connect to the machine, and probably I will also associate a network security group to this IP so that only me can enter from the routing perspective, and also I'm the only one that has the keys to get into the machine. If someone is probably um, worried about security in this aspect. So I'm working in this demo pivot server, and this is why you see this thing in here. So this is an Oracle Linux 7.9, nothing out of the ordinary. And right after I do that, the second thing that I do, I create a script service that basically sets up my pivot server right out of the open. I'm gonna make this example available in GitHub. It's actually here. Uh, I haven't yet make it published uh, as public, but it's gonna be here. So you should be able to see it here. It's gonna be named CloudRix demo, and uh, you can go to my GitHub account and just fork it from there. So what this script does, it basically creates a whole bunch of things. I'm not gonna go through the exact details of what it does, but for this demonstration in particular, it creates a specific directory structure, which is good to have. It's not mandatory, but it basically makes the difference in between what the backend and the front end is. So that's why you will see some directories that are called OCI-BE for backend and OCI-FE for front. So it also has some aliases that are already configured so you can quickly browse in between that. So yeah, this is just bash, don't, don't overthink it. Then um, I installed some packages that I always use. I installed Docker because I use a lot of container stuff. So it's not like I'm gonna do Docker now, but it's already there. So if someone can make use of that, it's, it's pretty cool. It installs, of course, um, the um, API. It installs some packages that are needed. It installs the latest and greatest Terraform version that is out there. It also installs a very uh, neat tool that is called Terraform Docs, which is open source and it allows you to quickly document your Terraform modules and some other stuff that I'm not going to go into the details. It creates some SSH keys. Um, it shuts down the firewall in case that that becomes a problem. It fixes some stuff in Visual Studio Code that doesn't allow you to have more than a specific number of files open at the same time. I heavily use VS Code, by the way, so it's pretty. It's pretty useful. And that's pretty much it. So right after I run this script, I will have two things to finish. The first thing is this um, compatibility API that I need to create. In this case, it's the credentials for my AWS key. I'm not gonna show it because it contains my key, but it complies to what I just showed you. And the second thing that I need to do is to fill out the configuration of my CLI, which is contained inside .oci and inside this file, which essentially is gonna be the same that is shown in here in my user. So if I go to my user in here, I go to user settings and I go to the API key that is on the left part of the screen, it's gonna contain whatever I get from the view configuration file. So it's the same content. So with that, you're in a position to work with the framework. So here's how it works. You have a backend file and here I'm filling the bucket where I'm going to store the status of the infrastructure. And this bucket is hosted inside OCI. Then I'm making a specific directory structure and I'm naming this file with whatever name that is. You can name this with any name. Then here I'm passing on the region where this bucket is. Remember that buckets in OCI are regional based, are not available all over the place. And then I'm passing on in here the hash of my tenancy, which in this case is this. And then I'm, then I'm putting uh, the uh, API, which is storage us ashman one which is the region, .oraclecloud.com. And these variables in here are required for this not to ask any passwords or things in the middle. Now let's go to the data source pattern. The data source pattern in the front end is not very complex. It's just like this. Not to go into much detail of it, I wanna show you how the backend brick looks like whenever you do this kind of thing. And I'm gonna walk you through the same example that I just mentioned. So in here, you will typically look for local accessors 
and the means to get the data that it's already created, okay? So there are some conventions, this thing needs to be in caps, just to make us just to make a point that this potentially um, can be unique. And for example, the subnet OSIT in here is going to get the accessor that comes from subnets. And this is what it's called a dynamic initializer. And in this case, I'm saying, well, if there is such subnet, then return it. And in any other case, return a null value. If you don't do that, basically Terraform is going to crash. And it's real bad because you don't really see that thing whenever it happens. So this is what we call a dynamic initializer. So if you see here, this is coming from subnets. So if I go to that definition up here, you will see that this is a data source pattern that contains the OCI core subnets and it declares the variable like this. So what do you need from the documentation? Remember that workflow. You need the compartment ID and you need the VCN ID, right? But the compartment ID is something that was already created. I don't have that. Same thing with the VCN ID. So how do I get those details? Basically, I get I need to get the compartment ID first. And I get that with this local accessor, which is the clerk downstream here. So the local accessor for the network, it's coming from NW compartments, and it's the ID that comes from that. So I need to go to the definition of this. And this is the cycle pattern that I was talking about. So if I go here, you will see that here I need the tenancy OSIP, but this is a terminal value because I already know what my tenancy OSIP is. So I don't need to look for this up. And then this is the terminal value that I need because this I can do a filter and I can filter it immediately by name. And how do I do that? I pass on a variable that comes from my PF bar file. So I'm gonna be able to introspectively look up for a value doing this pattern. So essentially, whenever I need that, then I just quote the local accessor and that's it. So it's gonna do it automatically. The same thing happens with VCN. So in order to get the VCN, the VCN is actually a terminal value as well. So I just filter it by the name of the VCN, not the OSIT, I don't hard code that. And here I pass on the compartment where that VCN is, which I already can log in from the things that I have. So this is how the data source pattern cyclic um, implementation works. So let's go into the front end again. The main file is where the magic happens. So if you see here, you have something that is called instance. So this is already gonna be my instances. And this is all the specific variables that the backend brick has. So you see that here, there is a convention that basically you are given the module name and you are prepending that to the variable. All of this in here is what it's called variable overloading because this variable as is comes from the backend brick, but I need to overload it in a way that I can pass on a variable here. And essentially, if I wanna copy this module and create a secondary set of computes, I can do that by just copying this and increasing that to zero two. So I don't touch the backend module, I just work in here. So in here, I'm basically making the key value pair um, definition of each variable and how it's gonna be represented on the front. The same thing happens with the file storage service here. Now, the good thing about this is that I can use module dependency. And the module dependency says that I cannot create this resource until this one is done. And I'm gonna run this as many times as computes I have declared in here. So that's why I have a count in here. So this is a new feature that was introduced in Terraform 1.0. And then I have a third thing in here, which is called ASCII art, which is gonna execute this script that I was talking about, which essentially is just gonna show you a specific screen that is gonna kind of show a mouse saying what my name is and what the time is. So I'm gonna show you the script later. So same thing. This module depends on the two upcoming modules. So this is not gonna get executed up until these two guys are done. So the good thing about this is that all of that timing thing that I was talking about, the use case gets resolved in Terraform from the get-go. You don't have to do anything else rather than just declaring the dependency of those things. So another important thing here is that I'm using directly the Devrel publish module and I'm using the tag and release feature in here. So essentially if I, for some reason, used the older version, so you see that this is 110 because it contained a bug, uh, my code is not gonna get broken. So that's why I don't go to the main branch here. So that's how the main works. Then the output is 
gonna spit whatever I'm pushing from the backend module. And there's a linkage here uh, that essentially works from module instance one, which is the name of the module in here. And then whatever thing I declare on the backend as output. So if I do a side by side here real quick, uh, you will see that in here instance is the output module. And this is how I use it in here. So that's how the output module linkage works. This is also Terraform stuff. So then I have the provider and then I'm making sure here that I'm using that provider. For example, now we have deprecated the usage of HashiCorp OCI. We're just maintaining this inside our own repository. So probably when I execute this, it's gonna show a warning. And then I pass on uh, some indices for OCI and OCI home stuff, which essentially makes sense whenever you're creating resources that are tied up to the home region instead of any region. Then I have my variables, which is the place where I do the variable overloading thing. So you see that this is actually a carbon copy of what I have on the backend. So if I go to compute variables in here, for example, uh, let me go quickly here. I basically copy this all the way down, do the control C, I paste this in here, and I prepend the module name. That's how you use this. So I will have to do this once and over, once and over and over again. And we have work in a library that does this automatically. I'm not showcasing this in here, but essentially this is this can be automated. So then um, if you keep scrolling down, then you have the variables for the file storage service. Same drill, you go to the backend brick, get the variables, push it there, and prepend it with the module name, and the same thing with the script. So that's what you got there. And last but not least, you have your system.dfr file, which is what contains uh, the specific modules, users, and stuff that you need to get in order to get uh, programmatic access with Terraform. So you have your tenancy OSID, your user OSID, your fingerprint, your keypad for the API keys, some SSH keys for your compute, et cetera. So you have all of the variables that are pretty much documented in the front end module. So if you go in here, backend module, sorry. If I see the preview for the backend brick, here you will see that this requires for a compartment, it requires for a VCN, it requires for a softnet where you're gonna put this, it requires for a compartment where you're gonna put the actual artifact because remember OCI has this pretty cool thing that decouples the network from the, from the artifact, the resource. And down here, you have examples of the things that you have to use. So basically the TF bar file is a copy paste from that and you just overload this for whatever applies to your case, right? Let me open the preview again. And uh, if you go here, there are some specific considerations in case that you need to use flex shapes or any combination in between, if you need to add an MSG or not, et cetera. You have a whole bunch of options there. So let me shut this down. Let me go back to the PF bar file in here. And here, for example, I'm creating a compute that is gonna be named demo Ubuntu. It's gonna have a single OCPU and it's gonna have 16 gigs of RAM, right? And then I'm creating uh, a fast storage service that makes use of an already created mode target inside OCI. So that's why I'm passing on the name of that thing. And in this case, it's demo MT. I pre bake that into uh, the tenancy because yeah, you can do it with code, but Chances are that you just do this once. So just do it like that. And then I'm passing on the SSH key here. And then I'm executing this script. I'm going to show you what the script lo looks like. It's pretty simple. In the end, it's just a bash script that installs uh, this uh, thing that is called boxes that allows you to put some stuff in um, the bash RC. And then I'm executing this thing that says, um, well, you are now logged in as user and it shows you the date and it pushes that into bash RC. This can be whatever script you want. So if you go to the system of bar file, you see here that this contains arguments. So I can pass on arguments to that script because that's the way the brick was built. So you can put whatever script you want and you can inject how many variables you want in there to use it at your will. So then, uh, I have some utilitary scripts here, and I always do this because essentially, if you want to connect this to a CI CD pipeline, uh, you will typically want to have something just from the get go to execute, but nothing out of the ordinary. This is start from init, validate, and then it doesn't apply with an auto approve, which you can typically run uh, manually as well, and then gets rid of the specific things from Terraform, like the module directory and the logging files. 
The destroy thing is exactly the same. The only thing that I change is apply for destroy, and that's pretty much it. So now let's see the demo. So if I go here and type in OCIFE, which is the alias that I create with the script, um, then I will go into that machine, right? And I'm just gonna hit the create.sh, which is this one. Remember, it's gonna do an init and a validate and apply. So I'm gonna hit enter here. And the first thing that it's gonna do, it's gonna download the modules from GitHub. So this is what it's doing here. And the cool part about this is that you can maintain your modules on your own side. You can hook it up to the ones that we provide, or you can make it fork of it. Use the code any way you like, because this is open source. So if you can make use of this thing in a way that it's useful for you, we're okay with it. If you wanna fork it, do it. If you wanna use straight away the one that we have in here, do it as well. We want you to use this stuff. Then uh, initializes the S3 compatibility API. So basically saying, okay, I'm gonna store the GIF state file in the backend. And then it initializes all the providers that we're gonna use. So here's the warning that I was talking to you about because now we have moved our implementation into Oracle OCI instead of HashiCorp OCI. So it's just telling you, hey, we're gonna change this. So eventually just make sure to update your backend. And then, it's going to tell you what it's going to do because it's going to do a, a plan. In between, it's going to do a uh, validate. And here, it's going to start creating the resources. So this is standard Terraform plan output. And then if you scroll down in here, it's going to create the computing here. And with the data source pattern in here, it's going to read for the compartments, mod targets, network compartments. That's why it's the best practice to do the local accessors in caps because you know what it's doing. And then it's gonna connect to that thing. It's gonna mount the disk. So essentially that's what it's doing here. And if you keep scrolling down, essentially then it's gonna tell you that this new resource, which is a special type of data in Terraform, it's going to uh, mount the disk. So then it's gonna connect back again to that machine and it's gonna wait for a little bit in order for the um, locking release of APT get inside Ubuntu freeze up. And once it does that, it's gonna install the modules that I was talking to you about, and it's gonna release the machine as done. So if you see here, this is showing you uh, what the SSH remote executor that it's contained inside the backend brick is doing. So in this case, it's connecting to that machine. And this is also, as I said at the beginning, a general problem uh, whenever you deal with this kind of stuff that you say, well, I'm using the module, but this is somehow not connecting to that machine. Yeah, always remember that whenever you use this kind of stuff, the um, connection has to be wrought to that instance that you're creating. If not, it's never gonna connect. So here is trying to connect to the machine 10.0.0.1.8. 186 that if you go to the tenancy in here and I go to instances, it's the machine that I just created. So if I come here, you see that this is gonna show that IP address. So it has a public and it has a private. So then if I keep scrolling down in here, this waits for two minutes actually. And right after it triggers that, it's gonna reconnect in here. It's gonna install everything that it needs. It's gonna execute the command and then it returns, okay, I'm done. So this is when the machine got created. So the expectations now would be if I connect to that machine with the proper credentials, it's gonna receive me with that entry. So I'm gonna paste in here, I'm gonna hit enter. It's gonna say, yeah, I don't know you, so include that in the no host. And this is what that script does. So it basically says, hey, hello, in this case, Danny, you're logging as user Ubuntu and the date is this in UDC time zone. That's what it does. So then if I want to destroy the machine, I basically just call destroy. And this is gonna take care of destroying everything. It's gonna re-download the modules. It's gonna read the configuration, the state bucket, and it's gonna do that for you. So what happens if two folks are trying to do the same thing at the same time, then the support in the bucket is gonna say, well, someone else is modifying this, so wait for it. And it's gonna take care of concurrency, which is something that used to be a problem uh, with Charcoal in the past. So if now I go to buckets, and that will be the end of the demo. Um, let me go here. 
you will see that in here, there is a status key uh, bucket, right? And in here, it contains the same structure. In here, it contains this sample key of state file, which in the end is some sort of JSON file, right? So if I download this, I'm gonna download it real quick. And I'm gonna put it in my desktop probably. And let me open this up in a new thing here. So it will be new window. And open. So you see that this is the JSON file that contains the actual status of the infrastructure. So as soon as this, this thing destroys the infrastructure, this file is going to be updated with now saying this is destroyed. This is important because if you don't store this file, then you will create the same infrastructure with the same name once and over and over again without really leaving any space for um, for reusage. All right. So, Sarah, I think we can take some questions. And so that wraps up everything. Thanks so much for joining us today, and we hope to see you again next time. All right. Thank you, guys.